Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Today we're going to discuss the orthodontist responsibility in the diagnosis and treatment planning and treatment of patients with temporomandibular joint disorders. Our guest today is Dr. Anoop Sandhi from Indianapolis, Indiana. Anoop is an expert in orthodontics and temporomandibular joint treatment. He was trained at Indiana University as an undergraduate dentist and also trained at the University of Illinois. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Now, I know that over the last 11 years or so, you have been a faculty member at the Indiana University, and now you're in private practice in, Indi in Indianapolis, is that correct? That is correct. I'm currently in full-time private practice. Now, during your career, uh, for one reason or another, you have focused on the role of the orthodontist as a temporomandibular joint diagnostician and the provider of treatment, is that correct? Uh, yes, uh, my original interest in that started shortly after I joined the faculty uh, at Indiana University. At that time, there really was not a uh, treatment service available to patients at the dental school uh, that presented with temporomandibular disorders. I started working in the area. My interest grew with time, and I pretty much focused most of my research and clinical efforts in that direction. Now, you've had quite a bit of experience on imaging of the joint, isn't that correct? That is the principal area of most of my research, yes. What sorts of things have you done? Uh, we began uh, with a study of uh, the different methods of imaging utilizing normal ionizing radiation and comparing the accuracy and clinical validity of transcranial radiographs, uh, corrected axis tomography. Um, we followed up with uh, uh, some recent work on magnetic resonance imaging uh, not merely in, in the diagnosis of uh, temporomandibular disorders, but also in identifying uh, how one could use MRI in uh, studying the effects of splint therapy and recapturing discs and so forth. Would you like to make some comments on the transcranial versus the tomography versus routine panoramic radiographs as far as TMJ diagnosis and treatment? Certainly. Uh, all of the uh, data that we have to date uh, primarily indicates that the transcranial radiograph has not proved to be uh, either accurate or reliable in studying uh, the possibility of pathological involvement of the joints uh, and certainly does not provide us with accurate information as to the condor position. The primary reason for this being that the transcranial radiograph is essentially a tangential radiograph of the lateral one-third of the superior articular surface of the condor. Uh, also, uh, such transcranial radiographs are routinely obtained at a fixed uh, axis uh, to the mid-sagittal plane, and indeed we find a substantial variation of the transverse condylar axis to the mid-sagittal plane. Tomography overcomes some of these impediments, uh, primarily because the tomograms can be s taken at different uh, axial inclinations for the transverse condylar axis. Uh, also because you can study the entire uh, joint, both from, from the lateral to its medial aspect, uh, it allows us to identify pathological lesions that could be overlooked in the transcranial radiograph. Uh, the third kind of x-ray you mentioned, the panoramic, uh, is, a, is uh, a peculiar x-ray in the sense that a panoramic x-ray is by definition a tomographic, tomographic x-ray because it involves concentric movement of the x-ray source and the film cassette. However, uh, in the region of the temporomandibular joint, it is not a true tomograph because the focal trough is reasonably wide, uh, and I would best describe it as a cross between a transcranial x-ray uh, or a lateral oblique x-ray and uh, a thick section tomograph. Most uh, panoramic radiographs are taken with the patient's jaw in a forward position, usually biting on a bite block. Right. Would there be any reason or would there be a possibility of having patient have a transcranial in centric occlusion and having the panoramic, the, the trough, so to speak, go through the joints. Is that a way that 
have you ever thought about doing that sort of a approach? Uh, we have attempted uh, some such x-rays. I indeed, recently there has been an effort to use panoramic uh, machines uh, and, to and to utilize the equipment for obtaining four x-ray views, uh, two on each side, closed and open, by simply resetting the cassette. And there is some equipment that permits that so that you end up with four frames on one panoramic film. Uh, the biggest impediment that we face is that because the focal trough is so wide, uh, in a panoramic x-ray machine. In the closed position, the degree of resolution uh, is inadequate to permit identification of pathology or even an accurate assessment of condylar position. Mm -hmm. In the wide open view, of course, uh, you can get a slightly better look at the condyle. Uh, that clearly is the only view where you get a decent look at it. However, again, it is a view of the entire condyle on one film Therefore, for example, a, an erosive lesion in the medial half of the condyle would be very difficult to identify. Would you like to make some comments about CAT scans and also MRI as far as its use in imaging as well? Uh, CAT scans, uh, of course, provide a great degree of flexibility in, in studying the temporomandibular joint. Uh, the primary uh, impediments to the use of CAT scans have been, uh, A, the cost, which, have been which has been decreasing, so that's uh, a little better now. But in addition to that, uh, the, the CAT scan involves a substantially high doses of radiation. Uh, we have no evidence to date uh, to indicate that a CAT scan will identify pathology more readily than will a well-taken tomogram, which involves substantially less radiation and expense. Uh, the one advantage of the CAT scan, of course, is the ability to study soft tissue and also the ability to highlight certain tissues utilizing the blink mode and other such facilities. Uh, I think the CAT scan has limited application but should be used uh, in uh, specific instances. There is, for example, the advantage of identifying uh, the presence uh, and position of the disc utilizing a CAT scan which is substantially less invasive than doing it with an arthrogram. Mm -hmm. uh, the MRI uh, provides the same facility for study as does a CAT scan minus the ionizing radiation, which of course is a tremendous advantage. Uh, right now, the principal difficulty with the MRI involves cost, which is substantial, and degree of resolution, which is not yet high enough to permit accurate identification of smaller structures. Uh, smaller structures meaning what? Such as the disc, the, the, uh, uh, the, the smaller ligament attachments to the disc, uh, which, which can, in fact, be identified on a CAT scan now uh, in some of the higher generation machines. The, the MRI has not yet been uh, developed to that point. Uh, we have found the MRI useful in, in gross studies of some of the larger structures. The, the uh, MRI, I think, has a substantial future to it, provided the surface coil application, which is essential uh, to localizing the temporomandibular joint on the film, uh, can be improved. The, the other impediment we have faced, of course, with the MRI is that uh, the length of time required to record all the signals in order to develop an image uh, precludes certain views. For example, uh, asking a patient to hold the mouth open for an extended period of time uh, ends up providing a very fuzzy image. It's very difficult to, for them to hold the mouth steady and open for several minutes at a time. Uh, an additional concern has to do with the presence of metallic appliances uh, and uh, some preliminary work that we have done on this to date uh, has indicated some difficulty uh, with appliances as they approach uh, the temporomandibular joint in proximity. Uh, the MRI is susceptible to not just the presence of metal but the distance that the metal is at. Uh, we have in fact found that second molar bands in the maxillary arch will distort the MRI signal on our patients. Mm -hmm. But the presence, for example, of ball clasps on a splint did not cause substantial uh, uh, distortion of the signal. So we are in the process of developing that information at this time. So from, we'll be talking a little bit later about the radiographs you would take routinely. Mm -hmm. But from your perspective today, I take it that the tomogram would be one of the things that would be of interest from a diagnostic stand standpoint. Clearly, at the present time, I, I view that as, as the principal workhorse uh, from in radiological terms. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about two 
sort of different categories of patients that would be routinely seen by the orthodontist. The first, which is the more complicated, is the person who is referred to you, uh, whether you could be an orthodontist or a periodontist or a prosthodontist or whatever, to you with a primary or chief complaint of some temporomandibular disorder. It can be clicking, popping, pain, headache, whatever. And the second type of patient, which I want to distinguish in our conversation today, is the routine orthodontic patient who never thought about having a temporomandibular joint disorder. Comes in because they have crooked teeth or they don't like the way they look or some other thing such as that. What I'd like you to do first of all would be to discuss with me today the aspects of your history, your examination, your radiographic examination, and other diagnostic tests that you would use if you knew at the onset that the chief complaint had to do with temporomandibular disorders. So you want to start from that? Certainly. Um, I think the patient that presents uh, with a complaint of a temporomandibular disorder must be viewed as a patient that requires a differential diagnosis for that particular complaint. Uh, that patient should not be viewed as an orthodontic patient. So uh, sometimes we have patients who come to the office and because of something they've read or something they've been told uh, will suggest on their examination, on their history form, that they are here to seek a consultation about braces for their TMJ, as, as most of them would put it. And the first thing to do is to dissuade the patient from believing that there is any direct reason for believing uh, that uh, orthodontic treatment will automatically improve their temporomandibular joint function. Uh, that patient should begin uh, the differential diagnostic process with a thorough history, both uh, of their medical and dental backgrounds. It is essential that we take the trouble to rule out a host of possible disorders. We are dealing with two synovial articulations, uh, which to the best uh, of my knowledge are not exempt from those afflictions that affect other synovial articulations in the human body. A complete medical uh, and, and dental history will help in ruling out a certain number of disorders. Now what specifically would you be looking for in a medical history for a TMJ patient? Uh, specifically I would look for vascular disorders uh, for reasons of vascular headaches and temporal arthritis and disorders of that nature. I would certainly ask about arthritic involvement of other joints in the human body. Uh, it is essential that a history of persistent headaches and any, and any medical workups for these headaches be examined. Uh, it is very tempting uh, to uh, compare symptoms presented by patients that have cluster headaches and histamine cephalgias, for example, with temporomandibular disorder pain, and, and the two have substantial parallels. Uh, <clears throat> other disorders uh, that could perhaps involve the temporomandibular joints, such as gout, uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, and other such medical disorders must be ruled out within that medical history. If a patient gives a positive response to a history of psoriatic arthritis involving two other joints in the body, then the burden upon the clinician is to make sure that the temporomandibular joint is not involved. And, and a radiographic survey, and if necessary, a rheumatological consultation will provide that assertion. Do you have any feeling for the percentage of patients that present to you personally who have uh, medical disorders as opposed to sort of traditional TMJ disorders such as clicking, popping, things of that sort? Uh, Is it a high percentage or a low percentage, somebody who presents with uh, uh, let's say rheumatoid arthritis, something of that sort. Rheumatoid arthritis is, is not a frequent presentation in the temporomandibular joint. Most arthritic temporomandibular joints uh, are primarily degenerative osteoarthritic in nature. Uh, the second most frequently occurring uh, would be rheumatoid arthritis. There is some disagreement in the literature as to the uh, incidence of this, but uh, I would say probably no more than 5 to 8 percent of patients with polyarticular rheumatoid involvement will show involvement of the temporomandibular joint. Uh, the difficulty that presents, of course, is it may be just 5 or 8 percent, but when it happens, we ha we're obliged to find it uh, and to treat the patient uh, correctly for it. Um, the, uh, if I may uh, clarify your question, uh, if we were to differentiate between joints that have 
intracapsular derangements or arthroses as opposed to pathology or, arth or, or any of the arthritides, I'd say the, the, the presence of pathology in my practice uh, in the joint, and, and as I said, it's primarily degenerative osteoarthritis with a smattering of some synovial chondromatosis and, and other uh, uh, tissue pathologies, uh, we find in approximately 20% of our patients some degree of pathological involvement. Uh, it, it should be kept in mind, however, that, that mine is a practice identified as one that treats TMJ disorders. Mm -hmm. So I am probably attracting a biased sample sure. in that the noisier joint may get referred here as opposed to be treated by the primary practitioner. Okay. Now, when you see the patient, um, I presume you, we've, we've talked about the medical history. Yes. Next thing would be to do the clinical examination. A complete clinical examination uh, of the uh, patient's uh, dental and uh, other oral tissues. Uh, if, in effect, if I may just say, include that in a comprehensive dental examination, which any good dental practitioner would okay, do. Okay, let's assume that, that we are, we've done the mm -hmm. routine. Now let's focus in on s what you would do, especially for the patient who complains of TMJ symptoms. That patient would, uh, would uh, in addition to an examination of the dental occlusion, of things such as cross bites and so forth, also uh, receive then a complete range of movement study uh, whereby we want to see what discrepancy uh, there is between uh, a, what I call uh, a point of initial contact and maximum intercuspation and, and what is frequently referred to as centric relation and centric occlusion. Uh, uh, in addition to such occlusal shifts, uh, the patient's ability to go through protrusive and lateral excursions uh, and, and the presence of any clicking, pain, or other noises in the joints associated with these movements, uh, maximum opening, uh, deviation upon opening, pain upon opening, uh, deviation and pain upon closure, uh, and uh, in addition to then a study of mandibular function, there would need to be uh, some palpation of the major muscles associated with mandibular movement, uh, palpation of the temporomandibular joints, auscultation of the joints, uh, essentially listening to the joints with at least a stethoscope, and if you would prefer a Doppler. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are the basic items of a clinical examination. Do you want to explain what a Doppler is exactly? A, uh, a Doppler in its simplest terms is merely a device uh, intended to amplify joint sounds so that they can be either heard through a speaker or recorded on an oscillograph. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a device which uses ultrasound technology for the purpose of amplifying uh, joint sounds. A a another application that most people are quite familiar with is using a, a Doppler type device to listen to fetal heart sounds, uh, which is a hard thing to pick up. Uh, obstetricians have utilized the, the, the technical, technological capability to magnify heart sounds. We do the same thing uh, with the joint. Mm -hmm. um, once these uh, items have been examined in, in the clinical examination of the patient, uh, the practitioner then makes a determination based on the history and the examination on whether or not there is a need for radiographs. I certainly don't think every temporomandibular, uh, every patient presenting with a temporomandibular disorder is a candidate for radiographs. Uh, any more than a, every patient presenting for a dental examination is. But should the indications for a radiographic examination exist, such as the presence of definitive joint sounds, I consider that uh, to be an indication uh, for uh, joint x-rays. Uh, significant limitation of movement, uh, significant deflection upon opening, uh, these are all things that would cause me to investigate the morphology of the joint radiographically. Uh, the radiographic examination in turn can be supplemented by some other diagnostic information that is available, uh, which would include, for example, selective use of medication, uh, diagnostic like injections. What, for example? Uh, comparing the patient's response to, say, muscle relaxants as, a, 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 as opposed to non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Uh, I prefer in these situations to use medications for relatively short periods of time. What is, what is a short period of time? Uh, I would say in the case of non steroidal anti-inflammatories, probably not to exceed two weeks. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen a response in about two weeks, I think it's time to reassess uh, whether there will be an impact. 
Uh, and the importance of that is that if, if a patient is responding extremely well to anti-inflammatory medication, uh, but responds poorly or not at all to, say, muscle relaxants uh, and, and analgesics, then that gives us some information. For example, it may indicate the presence of an, of an intracatheter inflammatory process, whether or not it is radiologically evident. Now, we have been talking thus far about the TMJ patient, mm -hmm. and I think you rightly said in the beginning that the TMJ patient is not necessarily the orthodontic patient, even though you as an orthodontist may see that individual. And it's very often that, that a patient would be given either by you or by somebody to whom you referred the patient a diagnostic splint. Uh, in my uh, experience, we try to not use a splint more than three to six months without some resolution of the symptoms of the patient. The symptoms, of course, being an elimination of pain, uh, any restriction in the uh, range of, of movement, be it wide opening or lateral or protrusive or whatever. And also the joint sounds question of crepitus and things of that sort. Now, when you treat a TMJ patient, is it your goal to eliminate the symptoms, the ones that I just mentioned, before any decision is made regarding whether or not you as an orthodontist will be doing the treatment? Uh, that's part of the goal, yes, a and I agree completely with the time frame that you described. I think, by and large, if a patient uh, has not responded in about six months to conservative management of a temporomandibular disorder, it is time to reassess the diagnosis and the treatment approach. Where do you go from there? Um, I, I would imagine that if in, in, the, in the resistant patient, uh, if indeed the original temporomandibular workup was thorough, uh, it is time to look uh, laterally, if you will, at the possibility of neurological involvement, at the advisability of a rheumatological consultation. Uh, there is considerable uh, information in the literature to the effect that certain myofascial pain patterns will confound the clinical picture through referred pain, mm -hmm. and that, in fact, your patient was, was more a candidate for management of cervical dysfunction uh, than of craniomandibular dysfunction. Uh, and, and Sometimes the conservative manage for the temp management for the temporomandibular disorder becomes a process of elimination at arriving uh, at the correct treatment plan. As, and that is precisely why the conservative approach is the treatment of choice. Uh, I think at that point you're obliged to call in help, uh, as indicated, depending on the pain pattern. Where do you think invasive procedures for temporomandibular joint dysfunction fit into this picture? In other words, uh, arthroscopic surgery, arthrograms, uh, open reduction or repair. Where do you, where does this fit into your scheme of things? Uh, I believe that there is reasonable consensus uh, based on the data we have at, at the present time that invasive procedures belong as a last resort. Uh, absent significant pain, there is some question about whether invasive procedures belong at all. Uh, in, in, in the presence of, of uh, a reasonable level of pain and and the failure to respond to all reasonable conservative means, I think you're obliged to investigate those possibilities. Clearly, arthroscopic surgery opens up an avenue that has not been available to us mm -hmm. because of our reluctance to open the joint capsule surgically. Uh, it is not without its hazards, and there have already been uh, several episodes of significant complications secondary to arthroscopic surgery. Uh, I do believe that arthroscopic investigation of the joint is is, is an excellent preliminary uh, if, if at that time uh, the indication for opening the joint capsule is evident, the patient is anesthetized and the joint capsule can in fact be opened. Uh, so I would almost uh, certainly feel at the present time that instead of opening the joint capsule directly, we can look with an arthroscope before making that decision to do so. Uh, actual opening of the joint capsule should be done in very specific instances for very specific reasons. Uh, it's not let's go look and see sure. uh, time uh, anymore. Uh, it, I think there is general consensus on the fact that the patient whose joint capsule has been opened is rarely the same again. Uh, the, the experience with artificial disc implants, for example, has not been good at all. Uh, so barring specific disc plications or removal of a trapped meniscus, uh, that is the source of considerable pain. Uh, and the presence, obviously, obviously of, 
definable tumors mm -hmm. that need to be removed. But with those few exceptions, uh, I, we do not recommend surgical invasion of the joint. Now let us assume that we were lucky and that the TMJ patient does respond to conservative therapy and you have given them a splint of your choice and they have worn the splint and while they wear the splint they are asymptomatic. When they don't have the splint in they're symptomatic. The person treating them for the TMJ disorder yourself or someone else says to you now the orthodontist um, I've done the best I can the patient is not in pain they don't have a click but as soon as I take out the splint we're in trouble and they say Okay, Dr. Orthodontist, you take over. Now, what is your approach in those types of cases? I know you've seen some both good and bad situations uh -huh. where people have worn overlay splints and teeth have been intruded and so on. But let's assume that this is a relatively well-treated standard case. How would you approach that as an orthodontist? If I, if I was not the one who did the splinting, and I think the question needs to be addressed that way, uh, then uh, I... I will admit at the present time to being somewhat defensive in my approach to those cases. My point being that there is such a uh, reasonable degree of variation and, and, and uh, disagreement within the profession about what constitutes proper management uh, uh, in splint therapy that uh, I prefer to assume the worst and examine the patient as if he perhaps still had, had a TMJ disorder. And for that reason, I conduct a thorough screening examination. In addition to that, if I'm being asked to do orthodontics specifically because of the patient's inability to function without the splint, I will obtain temporomandibular radiographs, without a doubt. Uh, and, and the radiographs will be obtained specifically with and without the splint because I want to document and then be able to explain to the patient and to any referring clinician precisely what changes occur in the joint with that splint. It is also important to record that because you need to make a reasonable assessment about whether the clinical objectives that you have been asked to meet are achievable. Mm -hmm. uh, not every change that is made with a splint is, it can be duplicated orthodontically. And I don't know that until I study the effect on the joints. Uh, in addition to that, of course, I would obtain a complete set of orthodontic records. Uh, upon analyzing the problem, for example, if, if, if we are looking at a case where the condyle is reasonably well positioned, and the term is a relative one we understand, uh, is reasonably well positioned with the nerve fossa, but upon application of the splint, the condyle is subluxed a half or three-fourths of the way down the articular eminence. Uh, I think it is unreasonable to expect that an orthodontic treatment result could be provided in that particular condylar location, uh, or, or for that matter, that it would be stable. Uh, conversely, if we have a condyle that is frankly posterior in its displacement, and is reasonably concentric upon placement of the splint, I think that is an achievable goal orthodontically. So uh, temporomandibular radiographs with and without the splint are, are, are an integral part of the orthodontic workup in that situation. And you're talking about the uh, tomogram? That is correct, yes, sir. Okay. Now, one final point before we get into the routine orthodontic mm -hmm. case. Uh, it's been my experience that the majority, probably the large majority of cases, that have been successfully treated with a splint. Uh, as soon as you put orthodontic appliances on those patients, obviously the splint will not fit anymore. Mm -hmm. And a surprisingly large number of these cases get along very well uh, without a intermediate splint, without you know trying to treat one arch and do a splint in the other arch and so on. Has this been your experience or what is your been your, your observations in this regard? I, I agree completely. Uh, I think uh uh, I think some of the reasons for that can be elucidated very briefly. Uh, there are occasions where you simply have to keep one arch splinted uh, while you treat the other. And there is a time we use, we do segmental tooth movement while we cut away parts of the splint. Those are all variations depending on the individual requirements of a case. Uh, I think in most situations, the reason those patients respond well are A, uh, if in fact there, w there has been reasonable repair of the original injury to the soft tissues in the joint, then they are able to withstand mm, uh, the absence of the splint for a reasonable period of time. The second thing, of course, is that uh, we routinely find that upon placement of the orthodontic appliances, day one, we modify the patient's ability to occlude 
in the way they did before the appliances mm -hmm. were on. Uh, certainly the bite is opened uh, in a reasonable number of patients. Patients for a number of days upon after placing the appliances don't really interconstrate with any force at all anyhow because of the tenderness they have. Uh, we routinely sometimes target treatment. In effect, if there's an anterior interference, I will specifically target my very first arch wire to go after that interference. Uh, those teeth are tender. By the time the patient starts occluding, they are starting to move. Uh, in fact, it was well recognized when we used to do uh, uh, full bands on, on the entire dental arch that the placement of separators would change the vertical dimension quite sure. readily. So I think the patient's ability to withstand that transfer has been underestimated by a lot in a lot of quarters. I do routinely discontinue splints and go directly into orthodontics. In those situations, I'm careful to band upper and lower arches at the same visit and get everything going that I possibly can on that very day. We don't band segmentally. Have you found, sort of to summarize this section of our discussion, have you found that the that if a patient is symptom-free or can be made symptom-free with a splint or with surgery or whatever, have you found that, that after the orthodontic appliances have been removed that 100% or 50% or what percentage of these patients actually remain relatively pain-free and relatively uh, have a relatively good range of motion? Most patients are... Well, the answer to that question has to be qualified by the limitation of time for the simple reason that we haven't been doing this very long. Uh, and for the period of time that I have followed these patients, which is really all I can restrict my answer to because there are some, uh, there are some inflated claims in both directions uh, in different parts of the country, uh, we find that the substantial majority of these patients have remained stable to date. I have had my share of patients who, after they were debanded, they are in retainers, and we have some recurrence, usually a partial recurrence of the original disorder. Uh, that should neither surprise nor dismay us. Uh, the surgeon that repairs 100 hernias does not guarantee that the, none of those hernias will ever uh, relapse. Sure. Uh, uh, I, I am I'm hard-pressed to give you a statistical analysis because we haven't worked up the numbers, but in my own practice, uh, in the last five years, I have definitely had fewer than five patients that I had to retreat out of 700. The, uh, the next aspect of our discussion, I think, should really focus on the bread and butter orthodontic patient. Uh, there have been uh, numerous um, situations over the last few years of orthodontists being uh, either sued or allegations made by both dentists and non-dentists alike regarding the effect of orthodontic treatment on the temporomandibular joint or whether or not there were symptoms that were not detected or whatever. Uh, given the environment today, what would you recommend to an orthodontist to do every day on every patient that he, he or she would see as an initial exam. What sorts of precautions should that person take in the absence of any frank pathology which would otherwise be obvious? Um, without a doubt, I think uh, we need to recognize that the patient presenting for orthodontic treatment alone for either dental health or aesthetic reasons uh, could have an underlying temporomandibular disorder that the patient is unaware of and unable to inform you about. Uh, that, uh, I think, places the burden upon the clinician to examine for the possibility of a temporomandibular disorder. Uh, I have done that for eight years in my practice and uh, continue to do so, uh, which means that in, in addition to a standard orthodontic examination, which we all understand, uh, I specifically check for excursive movements of the mandible and record, as I had mentioned earlier, protrusive lateral excursions, range of movement, the presence of any clicking or pain. Now these, uh, for example, the range of movement is actually 43 millimeters open and 7 millimeters left shift mm, and so correct. on and so forth. Right. I think that that's a very important aspect that any time a patient, whether it's during treatment or at the beginning of treatment, uh, that you should have some reference number. I had a case just recently of a, a surgery patient who complained perhaps two months of surgery of a single episode of TMJ dysfunction and we measured, I, I usually just measure the, inner, the maximum inner incisal opening. And I remember it was 41 millimeters with 10 or 12 millimeters lateral excursion. Mm 
um, month post-surgery, she could open 35 millimeters and uh, had one or two millimeters lateral excursion. And I think that instead of just saying to the oral surgeon, for example, I think this patient has a problem because she can't move her jaw very well, we could go back and look at a history before. And I think this is one of the points you're getting at, of being able to have something more than just a subjective she was okay. Mm -hmm. At least have, and I think that's one of the things that, that uh, uh, I think we both agree on as yeah. far as the importance of numerical data, even if it takes five seconds to make, yeah. just that single, single maximum interincisal opening, for example, gives a lot of information about range of movement. It takes astonishingly little time to do that examination. In addition, I think uh, it, it could conceivably save some trouble for both the patient and the orthodontist because there are underlying dysfunctions that patients fail to report. All of a sudden, if the patient is unable to execute a reasonable lateral movement and complains of pain upon attempting it, that should trigger the need for a comprehensive examination of that joint's function mm -hmm. by the orthodontist. Um, I do not believe that it is essential or even necessary or even proper to obtain temporomandibular radiographs on every orthodontic patient as a part of the preorthodontic workup. The need for that has not been substantiated. Uh, most of the claims to that effect have been anecdotal and hysterical rather than factual. Uh, there, as an example, if absent any reasonable symptom, if we were to start obtaining x-rays for the purpose of screening people, then we better start screening every joint and everybody every so often. Uh, indeed, the trend is away from that. The trend is away from annual chest x-rays, for example. Indeed, the American Medical Association has backed away from the annual mm -hmm. chest film requirement for good reason. It was, it was not providing any benefit worth the name for all the effort that was being put into it. Uh, if, the, if the underlying argument is that there may be an underlying condylar displacement which could later precipitate uh, an episode of uh, intracapsular dysfunction, uh, and, and the argument is that you must know that before you begin orthodontic treatment, then we would pretty much have to stretch that into other realms of dental care. Uh, we would then start having to take screening temporomandibular x-rays before we do third molar extractions, mm -hmm. before we do extensive root canal work on posterior teeth, before we do extensive crown and bridge work. Uh, that would clearly start to push the limits of, of ridiculous uh, examination of the, of the patient. The, the screening examination is a reasonable and accurate way of screening out any obvious disorders. There may still be an occasional patient who, who checks out normally in the screening examination of temporomandibular function and six months or a year into orthodontic treatment precipitates some symptoms. That patient should then be dealt with and treated in a manner appropriate with that clinical presentation. It is not the end of the world. If a patient develops a disorder a year into orthodontic treatment, we can suspend orthodontic treatment if necessary, treat the problem, and go back and recover it. That meets the standard of care mm -hmm. for any reasonable clinician today. Now let us, I'm sure this never happens to you, but uh, let's say that uh, 11 months into treatment, routine class two division one or class one non-extraction case, uh, you sit down with a patient and you say how you're doing and little girl rubs over here and says, I'm having some clicking or popping or whatever they would describe. What is it in your estimation that it is the obligation of the orthodontist to do when, you know, he's, he or she is interested in what arch wire to put in and all of a sudden the red flag goes up? What do you do that appointment with that patient in the chair? Uh, I wish you were right, but it does happen to me. And, and what... Uh, I, what happens at that time is the following. If the patient presents with, let's say, clicking and pain in one joint at that point, uh, and I'm planning on putting in a, in a rectangular arch wire with finishing details, uh, the offline treatment must stop. And the reason is not because of some hysterical overreaction to this, but because sometimes this could be the precursor for more serious things to come. And I have an obligation to the patient to prevent things from getting worse once the problem has been identified. That patient would receive a thorough examination of the temporomandibular joint dysfunction. Uh, once I had arrived at a differential diagnosis, 
I think on the younger patient particularly, sometimes time is your best ally. There are such things as transient intracapsular derangements. Sometimes secondary to arthritis treatment, sometimes not. It doesn't matter. You can have a transit intercapsular derangement after having a class one amalgam restoration. Mm -hmm. One must not react to that by following up every class one amalgam restoration with an occlusal split. So uh, that patient would then be treated if necessary or, or observed over a period of time. Uh, what would your instructions be to the patient? The patient would immediately be placed on instructions that would be designed to prevent any further injury to the joint. Let us assume for the sake of argument that I have examined the patient and arrived at the diagnosis that there is an anterior displacement of the disc in the left temporomandibular joint associated with some intracapsular and perhaps even some myogenic pain uh, secondary to that displacement. That patient would be given the following instructions. The patient would immediately go on a soft diet, the idea being to exercise the joint as little as possible. The patient would clearly be checked for any possible interferences in the occlusion such as an anterior interference that would exacerbate the problem mm -hmm. and if necessary relieved uh, of that interference. The patient would be prescribed heat application which has proved to be very useful in, in joints with fluid buildup and also in myogenic pain. If necessary the patient would be given some analgesics to help her with the pain. Uh, I would follow the patient depending on the degree of severity of the disc in a few days or a couple of weeks. If the problem starts to resolve I'll wait and watch and if the problem is worsening I'll obtain radiographs, do whatever is necessary, and if necessary, splint the patient. Mm -hmm. but, but then we are dealing with a specific problem that has occurred and right. that is definable. In some of the um, legal actions that have been taken against orthodontists, one of the recurring themes, and I think is a very important point, is not the fact that there was a single incident. I mean, you know, everything is going beautifully and all of a sudden the patient develops joint dysfunction. That's not, even though that's the first red flag, that in itself is not malpractice or anything else. I think that the, the common complaint is that there was this mistake that was ignored or something was not done and then it went on further and then it would have been appropriate at that time to consider a splint or to get a second opinion or whatever. And that it's not just a single incident such as somebody developing a click on Monday the 23rd of October but rather that there was this and then there was this and then there was this and this so that when we get finished and look back retrospectively over this situation, the, it's a compounding of errors rather than a single incident that leads the orthodontist into trouble. And I think that's what we've been addressing today of doing the, the proper history, the proper clinical examination, whatever imaging is necessary and other ancillary types of tests to really define as soon as we can what the problem is. And I think all of us recognize the fact that the TMJ s situation today is certainly more well-defined than it was five years ago. Um, in 1983, when we had the symposium here in Ann Arbor, where we addressed the developmental aspects of TMJ, my feeling at that time was I knew less after the symposium than I did before. I mean, seriously, and it was not, not to be funny. And I think that now with, of course, with the increasing uh, litigious atmosphere and also with the, the more people being interested in this problem, I think we're beginning to see at least some focus of our attentions and I think that's some of the things that we're addressing today. I, I agree and I, I think uh, the, the situation you have raised about uh, uh, perhaps some medical legal complaints uh, resulting not so much from having caused a problem but from having ignored a problem that that was either caused or, or existed uh, uh, prior to treatment. Uh, I, I think that point is extremely valid and extremely important. Uh, it would be a simple matter for me to uh, use an analogy whereby if I was under treatment for a heart murmur and was seeing my cardiologist on a regular basis and, and he's been listening to my heart and he's, he's doing whatever treatment is appropriate, then I come in one time and say, you know, my knee has really been hurting. And he says, yep, but I'm here to listen to your heart. I think I'd be disappointed in that physician uh, because he's, he's missing the point of the care he's supposed to provide. Uh, uh, similarly, if a patient comes in with a complaint, uh, specifically a complaint related to the temporomandibular articulation, the orthodontist is obligated to either check that out or if he's uncomfortable, find appropriate help for that patient. Sure. But one, it would not be a good idea to pat the patient on the back 
and suggest that it will all go away right. without knowing for a fact that there is good reason to expect that it will go away. Well, thank you very much for spending time today. I think this was an interesting discussion, and I, and I feel that we've at least hit on some of the major problems that an orthodontist could be faced with in routine practice. And I have a feeling that as the TMJ interest grows, not only in the orthodontic community, but also in dentistry in general and in the lay public, that this is a problem that will perhaps five or ten years from now increase significance rather than decrease significance. Thank I you. appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.